Hi and welcome to Fail Lab Lectures. In this lecture we are going to discuss about measurement and one dimensional motion. So measurement is a basic thing in physics. Why the why we have physics is to because to measure things, because to understand how to measure things. Of course in chemistry also you do measure the chemicals and you put and you do the equations and it's called as a stoichiometry, however we're not interested in that. But we're interested in calculating stuff such as mass, time, length, you know, how much distance you travel today, and you need physics, not chemistry, however. So we are going to discuss about those things. Those, the length, the mass, and the time are called as these are what are the things you do use to measure. It's called as quantities under standard physics. So I'm going to introduce you to some of the basic quantities. But before I do that, I'm going to have to define physics because it's one of the first lectures that will introduce you to the measurements uh, well, physics is a study of nature there is no definition in this world that can completely define all the branches of physics at, a, at once so physics is a branch of engineering physics is a branch that studies nature so it's just nature How, whatever things happen in nature it's just put in, in physics so that's what is physics is all about. So the language for physics is mathematics. So without complete understanding or knowledge in mathematics, one cannot expect better understanding of physics. As you shall see, till date I've been doing lectures, you know, which didn't have any mathematical equation. Of course I, I might have mentioned a few but Generally, it had no mathematical equations, but uh, well, it's not the same now. It will have, uh, I mean, the lectures from now will have complete equations, uh, and of course, the problem solving will be done in a separate uh, series of lectures. Uh, it's just the, you know, the explanation stuff that one needs uh, to understand the concepts in physics. So this is the concepts in physics. Uh, lectures uh, which will supposed to uh, you know spread the physics as well as you know help people understand physics to certain depth of course it's not the highest level that I'm going to explain to you but I'm not going to explain it to you at the lower level also so it's somewhere in the in between uh, so that it's kind of tough for the beginners but I think if we can give it some time uh, we'll be hopefully uh, be able to understand physics in detail. So this is what we uh, call as the base quantities in physics. So the base quantities are the mass, time, and uh, well, length. So these are the three basic quantities in physics, the mass, time and the length. So mass is expressed in terms of kilograms, time is expressed in terms of seconds and length is expressed in terms of meters. So what's the standard? So somebody might say I have a tape, a tape that measures or that says one meters so I use it as a standard but you cannot do that my friend. The thing is that we have a standard and the standard for one kg is well is divided into two thanks to the interwe intervening of chemistry into physics so the basically what we use um, to represent one kilogram is the platinum iridium alloy of uh, height 3.6 centimeters and uh, it's, a, it's a cylinder of platinum iridium and um, it's kept at the standard weights uh, and uh, it, it is it measures one kilograms so next the time well time is measured in terms of seconds so well it's for every 9 billion oscillations of a cesium atom, you know, the radiation that is emitted by a cesium-133 atom, 
for every 9 billion oscillations of that radiation, you actually account for one second. And then, just imagine how fast the oscillations are. So, as uh, with the oscillations nearing, or it's more than 9 billion actually, it's a rough estimate that I'm, uh, that I'm discussing with you. Uh, length meters, so it's it's the distance traveled by light in vacuum in a fraction of a second is called as one meter. That's the standard everyone, every country around the world has agreed to that. Well, I'm not, this is called as, uh, this is all, this all comes under a system called as SI system, the system the international lane. I'm not going to talk about the CGS system or whatever the system that came before because it's completely waste of time discussing about it but of course I've learned it I'm being honest I'm, I've learned it and I uh, recommend everyone to learn it because you'll understand how physics evolved with time all right so that's very important but again if you want you can remember it or you study and you forget it. all right but uh, more, more, more importantly these are called as the base quantities so base so everything, it's a base, a uh, foundation to every other quantity in physics that I'm going to introduce you to, whether it's Newton's or, or any other quantity that you'll, you'll come across in the days to come. So this is the length, the, uh, the three represents the base quantities. Of course, we are going to talk about the fundamental quantities. For that, I'm going to have, have to add some more. So the electric current is one of the fundamental quantities and uh, it's uh, measured in terms of amperes and uh, well so the next thing is uh, the amount of substance again we go to chemistry of course chemistry is uh, basically physics uh, chemistry is a branch that has risen out of physics to be honest so again, uh, whatever they do is nothing but physics. So it's a molar substance is measured in terms of mole, uh, thanks to Robert Andrews uh, theory, and then uh, you get the thermodynamic. Or absolute temperature, which is measured in terms of Kelvin, absolute temperature or the thermo, thermodynamic temperature is measured in terms of Kelvin and uh, the last one is the, is the luminous intensity and uh, it is measured in terms of candela okay so these are the fundamental quantities and they are measured in terms of fundamental units and hence we uh, basically wrap up measurements so I think this introduction will be helpful for you uh, in order to you know solve the dimensional analysis the dimensional equation uh, that you might encounter in some you know, while, uh, while you're being introduced to uh, the, the fundamentals of physics. Uh, so, so, as I said, it's just a waste of time for me to, again, keep telling about that. Uh, so, I'll just move on into one dimensions. However, I'm going to give you a, a basic idea about how one dimension, two dimension, three dimension looks like, uh, you know. It's standard physics. And these days, what happened because of the popularity that the 3D films or the movies, 3D movies have, have got, you know, people just tend to think that um, you know, making uh, claims as such as it's a 4D movie, 5D movie and some fools make 7D movies also in the malls where you get uh, these, these scary things that takes place as a seven dimension. So, is that true? Well, it's not true. We have only four dimensions in the universe that we know. 
So the first dimension is uh, can be represented in this way, you know, with the origin and the x axis, the horizontal component that I'm, I'll be taking. So this is nothing but a simple way to represent one dimension. So a body moving in straight line at any angle, it doesn't matter. Okay, it just have to move in a straight line. It's called as one dimensions. So if the body just makes a right or a left turn then it is called as, uh, I mean, it's represented as two-dimensional, x, y, and zero. So the origin is a place where everything is zero, completely zero. So here, you know, the body takes a turn, then a right or left or up or down, then it's called as, uh, I mean, it is represented as two dimensions. So uh, if the body, again, you know, involves in uh, a left or a right turn, as well as a hill climb or a decline, then you represent it in three dimensions, x, y, and z. So say you're in a Lamborghini car and you're moving in a straight line, straight line, no ascent or descent, or no left, no right. So you're just going straight, then it's called as one dimension. The moment you you try and turn your Lamborghini car towards left or right, still moving, then it's, it's you represent it in terms of two dimensions. Okay? If you're going up a hill and then you take a turn, you know, like in the switchbacks and uh, while climbing a mountain or, or whatever you do, uh, ascending a mountain in one sense, then you represent it in three dimensions. What about four dimensions? But four dimensions is pretty complex in one sense to represent in a two-dimensional plane. So this 3D diagram that you're seeing here is not correct because it's it's the two-dimensional plane that I'm writing in, but it's the best I can do below me. And I forgot to mention that in two dimensions, the horizontal and the vertical component are perpendicular. In this three dimensions, all the axes that I've drawn are perpendicular to each other. So here these x, y, and z line are mutually perpendicular. x and y are perpendicular here in two dimensions. So here, we get x and y and z. So normal three-dimensional representation for four-dimensional. But, of course, there comes the time. So, in two dimensions, the best I can do is, you know, the time is overlooked by the three dimensions. That means that the three dimensions is, is confined within the time dimension. So if you can understand that, right? So the time, actually, the same thing, the x, y, and z are mutually perpendicular here also, but the time is perpendicular to the to the plane containing all the three dimensions. So it's not just perpendicular to the y, it's perpendicular to the x, y, z plane. Okay? So the time is perpendicular to the x, y, z plane. So this is the basic understanding that one has to have. However, I'm not going to discuss about the two dimension or the three dimension or four dimension until I finish up the classical mechanics. So I don't have to worry about that uh, because I'll be explaining it in detail when I come to uh, the relativity, but for now we'll focus on one dimensions. Okay? So how do you represent the position of a of a particle? Position of uh, of a particle. So the thing is, since it's one dimension, I'm going to make this horizontal component as my reference all the time, and uh, you know, with uh, with this uh, with your lines that I'm going to draw as a, a standard any units, doesn't matter. So here, O is the origin, as I said, where everything is zero. And uh, say, a particle A is three units from zero. So how do you write the position? So you say, the position of the particle is, is three units from the origin in the positive direction of x. Okay? The position of the particles is 3 units from the origin and 
it is in the positive direction of x. Hence, the position, say, a, small letter a, is 3 units a plus x direction. That's how you write. Okay? a is equal to 3 units in plus x direction. Alright, so that's that's with uh, the position. So what's up with the with the distance travel and the time, you know, or the displacement? These are the two most of the time often mistaken to be the same, but there is a lot of difference between the displacement and the distance. So we'll talk about the distance first. So distance is uh, well, the total uh, amount of well, the units traveled by the body, total amount of units. So here I say, uh, consider an example where the body travels from uh, zero, the origin, till one, two, three, four. You know, one, two, three, four. So this is uh, the x1 and uh, the xi and the xf. So the initial and the final position of the body is the origin itself. But the body travels from, I say let me make it bigger for you. So this is the origin, this is 1 and this is 2 and this is 3 and this is 4. So the body actually travels, body travels from you know from zero to four and four to zero. So the distance is and you know, this is the say x two and this is the x one. So the total distance traveled is nothing but x one plus x two. And then you get eight units. So the body travels eight units from from zero 2, 4 and 4 to 0. So this is a round up, you know, like say, you know, like this. Of course the body doesn't travel like this, however it, it travels in a single direction since it's one dimensional motion. So the body come, goes from here and then from here back to the origin. So, so the initial and the final positions are the same, but the distance travel is 8 units and the displacement is 0. So the displacement is 0 because the initial and the final positions are the same. And that's not the reason. The reason why displacement is 0 is because displacement is vector and distance is, is a scalar. So I expect you to know what's a scalar and a vector. So the scalar is a quantity that that's got only magnitude, no direction. Okay? That's called as a scalar. A scalar is something that, uh, that's got only magnitude, not direction. But vector has both magnitude as well as direction. Uh, hopefully, if I can, I'll make sure that I do, in, do a lecture on vectors and scalars separately. Of course, uh, these days people are being taught about the vectors and the scalars in the high school. So we just don't want to worry much about that as, as of now. I think hopefully you must understand the differences between the two. So since we know about distance and displacement, let's make some mathematical assumptions, not assumptions, but the results derived from both distance and displacement. So what's the relationship between the distance and the displacement? So at any given uh, instant, distance can be greater or equal to displacement. So this is the um, mathematical relation that you wanna, one can arrive that the distance is greater or equal to displacement. Okay? I you know why. I don't have to again repeat 
you know, whatever I told, so I think you know why very well. So we'll just move on to something called as speed. So speed is of two types. You can measure speed um, you know, in two ways, the average speed and the instantaneous speed. So for the average speed, most of the cases, that's what you do. You measure the average speed. Um, so that S average is equal to the total distance, how much the total distance traveled by the body in uh, and the total time taken by it. So that gives you the speed, average speed. And if you want to calculate the instantaneous speed, you take uh, the distance at certain instant of time uh, in the in the you know in the in the path of uh, of the body, and um, you take a point, and then at that point you just try and put in the values of the total the time taken uh, to reach that point from the origin and the distance. Um, Travel in that particular time interval, so you get the instantaneous speed. So skipping to the velocity, things getting things get interested here. Interesting here, actually, v average is uh, the total displacement by total time. Taken. Velocity is a vector, speed is scalar. Speed doesn't have directions, but if you give direction to the speed, it becomes velocity. Okay? So it's the V average is the total displacement taken, uh, the total displacement by the total time taken by the body to for that particular displacement. Okay? So everything, when you calculate speed or velocity, you must make sure that you take in the total distance traveled in accordance with the time interval. Okay? So you cannot take how much of a distance you want and uh, you miscalculate uh, the time interval so then everything goes very bad, uh, obviously bad. So what about the instantaneous velocity? Where there is a simple formula that we use, uh, there is nothing but the derivative of uh, the displacement with respect to time. So, um, ds by dt is uh, what gives you the instantaneous velocity. But however, you can calculate instantaneous velocity with by using graphs, which I'm going to do in the next lecture. Uh, not in this lecture, uh, with, uh, with, the, you know, with the, the graphs and, um, and the two-dimensional motion. Both will uh, you know, make it up. So, um, the next thing you'd be interested in is the acceleration. So the acceleration of a body is, uh, is something that occurs when the velocity changes rapidly. So, so there is a, a very good, beautiful story behind this. Uh, all these things that I've told till here and the things that. Have they were about to tell you now. So the speed and the velocity was known when Galileo was alive. I mean, well, Galileo knew he calculated things based on these, th uh, you know, uh, various uh, uh, quantities. Uh, but Galileo was not able to call it as acceleration, but in instead he called it as the rate of change of velocity. So the rate of change of velocity gives you an acceleration, and the rate of change of velocity, if you measure uh, the formula is you get the instantaneous acceleration dv by dt is nothing but the rate of change of velocity but however Newton invented calculus this is Newton's formula the ds by dt dv by dt that gives you the instantaneous acceleration that's Newton's formula but however you calculate the average acceleration what do you do is nothing but the velocity in that particular time interval. So V by T gives you the acceleration. 
So it's quite simple. But as I said, keep in mind that you take the values of the numerator depending upon the time interval. Okay, in whichever formula is, whether it's speed or velocity or acceleration, make sure that you take the, the value of the numerator in accordance with the time interval. Otherwise, your values can go horribly wrong. Okay, so this is the basic introduction to the velocity uh, and speed and as well as the acceleration. However, as I said, the rate of change of velocity, uh, the, because you know when I introduce you to the forces, the Newtonian laws of motion, then I'll tell you in the next lecture, however, uh, for now, uh, or maybe I might as well mention at the end of this lecture itself. So, the acceleration is, is it, it played a vital part in Newton's laws of motion. So, Galileo was a person who was, you know, experimenting every single day with, uh, you know, like bodies smashing into one another, you know, uh, when something smashes into the other, the other the acceleration is transferred, you know, or the force with, you, with which you push creates an acceleration. And he said that it creates what is called as, um, you know, basically called as the rate of change of velocity. And rate of change of velocity, according to the calculus, is nothing but uh, the acceleration itself that the Newton named according to his uh, laws of motion. So. Um, this is the, one of the basic introductions I think that would, that would help you understand uh, whatever is supposed to be coming on its way uh, for you to understand physics in a deeper sense. So we're going to solve some problems again on this, uh, but again not in this lecture. I'll, uh, in a, after completing all this theoretical part, I'm going to do all the uh, formulas, uh, I'm going to introduce you to all the formulas, all the cases, we'll discuss about the mathematics in detail and in depth, of course, while we solve problems and we can discuss problems at the end. But for now, we'll focus on acceleration, free fall acceleration. If you remember, one of the first lectures that I did was on this free fall accelerations. Galileo actually went to the Leaning Tower of Pisa and dropped two identical balls, not pens of course, and observed that the two identical balls fell towards the ground at the same instant of time. So, the, so he calculated from based on the, the observations he made that the body would accelerate say this body A is falling towards the ground so at one second the body velocity would be uh, you know 9.8 meter per second because in this interval of time the body would accelerate at 9.8 meter per second squared and again in the next second, the acceleration remains the same, it's a constant acceleration, but the velocity is double that, so it's about 19.6 meter per second, and so on with the equation. However, so this is the way the, the body falls, but again, while you do, you have to remember that you need to introduce minus signs of, you know, for the acceleration as well as the velocity because the vertical component that I am using is increasing in this direction and the body is falling opposite. So the minus g is what you use when the acceleration due to gravity is towards the earth that in the sense the body is falling towards the ground and you use minus g for the acceleration due to gravity and, and so on. So, so this sums up my one dimensional motion as well as uh, introduction to uh, the measurements. Um, well, I just want to say thank you to everyone in this world because my lectures are being viewed in more than 30 countries around the world and, uh, and I thank you everyone um, for your support. 
this is my mission to spread the word science as well as physics because it's so interesting see and I want everyone to learn and love physics because it's it's very vital in order for anyone to lead a good life all right so one might argue that money is but of course if you don't have common sense you get nothing so physics or science as a whole is nothing but common sense and it it helps you survive anything and that's why I love science and my mission is to spread the word science and hence I hope if you like this lecture I hope you can share it so that more and more people get educated uh, and my mission will be a grand success. Thank you very much.